flawless experts who have all the answers. <laughs> That's not this podcast. Instead, we chat with professionals who love what they do, have wisdom to share, and can laugh at their own mistakes. I'm Mark, and I'm the host of the Workplace Solutions Podcast. So let's laugh, learn, and discover the joy of work. Boo, boo, boo. All right. How are you doing today, Alexandra? I'm doing great, Mark. Thanks, man. How are you? I'm good. I'm going to pretend like we didn't just chat for an hour. And... <laughs> <laughs> no, that, totally. Not at all. This is our first time meeting. Yes. <laughs> all right. I am here today with Alexandra... Melville Rawlings Kierkegaard Goodrich, or as she's known, Alexandra Goodrich with, I do like some fake middle names. Uh, <laughs> I've also gotten Alexandra Jack White Goodrich. So Oh, I, that's pretty I, good. I, thanks, man. <laughs> I appreciate it. All right. Alexandra is a teacher, artist, improv performer, and I'm going to say part-time linguist. I don't know how to... <laughs> I mean, part-time English tutor. Would okay, be. there, there we go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I kind of like linguist, I but do too. English that tutor. Makes me, that sounds way cooler. Like, yeah, yeah. That's All right. what I'll put on my, my <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I tried to find your LinkedIn, and it just said you were a student at Columbus State University. Yeah, which is the first and only time I've ever looked at a LinkedIn. Okay. Remember, <laughs> uh, our our good mutual friend Jim Carwish had sent me like a. I don't, not an announcement, an invitation. And I was like, yeah, this looks cool. And then never did anything with it again. <laughs> so today we're already laughing. That's good. We're going to be talking about fun with art and improv. And I'll give Alexandra a moment to introduce herself and uh, we'll go from there. Sound good? Yeah, that sounds great. So my name is Alexandra Kierkegaard, Jack White Goodrich, as Mark has clearly <laughs> stated. Um, <laughs> so I, I, my background is in art and art education, and I have been off and on teaching since 2015. Okay. Yeah, since 2015. My very first job was in a public school, like South Atlanta area, and I came in halfway through the year because the other art teacher left. So that was my very first experience into like public school teaching. And I realized well before that, when I was like 19, that art was something I always wanted to pursue. I was that nerd in school who was just doing art band, theater, chorus, everything. Um, so art in any form was something I wanted to do. And I had a teacher, uh, Oren Morris, who was very influential to me at that time. Uh, I took his art classes after school every Wednesday for like six years. And I was like, this is what I want. And yeah, I pursued a degree in art ed. I've been off and on between teaching in public schools, teaching in private schools, teaching private lessons at people's homes, working in various jobs <laughs> <laughs> from improv to working at the High Museum for a little bit. Been, oh wow it was amazing yeah worked at the high museum did some retail did some <laughs> waiting it's been quite a menagerie of life experience since 2015. so if you're not familiar with the art world or the atlanta area that is the uh i guess the main art museum in atlanta yeah it would you'd be kind of like the atlanta's you know moma essentially like the museum of modern art okay um, perfect yeah this is the time of the thing where we normally do our reminders and icebreakers. So reminders, if you are attending the AEE, which is the Association for Experiential Education International Conference in November in Black Rock, North Carolina, I will be presenting on the eight R's of leading activities. So what are the eight R's? Come to our workshop and you'll find out. <laughs> and if you are in the Rome, Georgia area where I live, we have the Rome Business Expo in November and I'll have a booth at that. All right. So normally we do an icebreaker, but instead of an icebreaker, because you are an improv performer <laughs> and I pretend that I'm an improv performer. <laughs> you do great, Mark. You really do. <laughs> Instead of an icebreaker, we're going to play an improv game. Yes. And so explain to us, heck yeah, which is edited PG version. Tell us what that is, and then let's play it. So it is a game to encourage 
the very first idea that comes to your mind in terms of a impersonation. So it's getting rid of the fear of, oh my gosh, is what I'm doing right? Because the second you do it, everyone in the group is going to encourage you with the heck yeah. And it's just, it's just building that kind of support system within yourself and within the group. So. All right. So neither Alex or I have prepared each other on anything we're about to say. <laughs> so I have no idea. So why don't you go first? Give me a, <laughs> uh, a heck yeah to do. Um, I don't know if you guys who are listening are aware, but Mark does a beautiful impression of Porky Pig. <laughs> it, is, <laughs> it is golden. Oh man, I immediately thought of Donald Duck. Um, <laughs> you can I, I'm a I'm a pig named Porky, and I don't remember what the voice is supposed to sound like. <laughs> Heck yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And that's the beauty. If you don't know how to do it, you do it anyway. Exactly. All right. So, so Alexandra, you know, most folks don't know this about her, but she is just the number one Justin Bieber fan on the planet. So. Oh my gosh, you guys, I cannot express how much I love Justin Bieber singing the Justin Bieber sings on this particular album song. I have seen every one of his concerts. He has signed his signature on my eyeballs. And also, <laughs> um, Despacito was incredible. <laughs> I don't know what that is, but heck yeah, heck yeah. <laughs> I love that. I think he's Canadian. He's definitely Canadian now that okay. I have more of it. Yes, he is. I think he was discovered on YouTube. Fun fact. Um, oh, was it? Nice. Good for him. Yeah. Oh. Uh, that could have been me. <laughs> that that could, have been, could have been me too, Mark. We could have yeah. been the next Justin Bieber. But I'm, we can be better. I'm actually glad I'm not the, just, the next Justin Bieber. Uh, that's, that's something I definitely think about. I'm like, I would like the money that comes with fame. I don't want the stress that comes with fame mm -hmm. <laughs> for certain. All right. So <laughs> thank you for obliging me. She did not know I was going to do that. Oh, I uh, that. <laughs> <laughs> but you're fun. All right. So one of the things that, you know, one of the art genres that we play with is performance art in, in terms of improv. But before we get into that, I was curious, what, what kind of art mediums are your thing? Like I get, like I'm a sculptor or I'm a painter or kind of what, where do you spend your time? Yeah, that's, so I do definitely feel more like a jack of all trade and master of none. Cause I mm -hmm. love dipping my toes into many different things. Drawing is my absolute foundation. That's what I've done for the longest time. Um, and I really did love charcoal uh, drawing. Uh, it's so messy. And by the end of a night in the studio in university, I looked like a coal miner, <laughs> just covered in this dust. It's probably not healthy to breathe. It's the black lung, Pop. <laughs> <laughs> Very likely, um, if anything will get me. There's a weirdly high percentage. It might be black lung. Um, <laughs> um, so. Drawing is my foundation and I love it. It's so easy to come back to, but my next would be, I really do love ceramics. Okay. Um, Cause there is this, just that, that sense of building with your hands is so, I don't know how to describe it. It's so meditative, but like conscious at the same time. I don't know. You'll have a moment of like pure Zen when you're just like working with clay and building something with your hands. And then like a moment of pure rage when it doesn't work. Like the way <laughs> and it's just this constant problem solving. And I, I just love that smell of earth and the feel of like clay. Mm. So that would be my second. I'm actually in my second year of stone carving, which is really. What is stone carving? Exactly what you think. So you get uh, I'm working with alabaster. Mm -hmm. And we're, it's just all like regular, like hand tools. And you're just learning how to carve through stone, how to shape it and mold it. It's such a different process. I had never done anything like this before. But the school that I'm at has a tradition of asking the art teacher to teach the eighth years, which is the last year of kids mm -hmm. at our school, stone carving. 
And so that's, I'm learning while I'm teaching, while I'm learning. And it's really cool. And it's kind of fun because I get to go through that process with the kids of like, oh, I hate this right now. Like, this doesn't look good at all. And so we get to work through that together of um, how do we move past this? Because clay is additive. Mm -hmm. So if you mess up, you can kind of remold it, add something to it. Stone is subtractive. And once it's gone, man, that's gone. So in terms of the visual arts, I think those three have been the most interesting lately. Oops, I guess if Venus de Milo is not going to have any arms. <laughs> well, yeah, like you look at the Sphinx and you're like, yeah, <laughs> that sucks. Noses are hard. <laughs> Noses are so hard. <laughs> they are, <That's>... though. <laughs> Venus de Milo is the one with the, without the arms, right? I mean, there's a bunch without the yeah, arms. Yeah, there's but... a ton. Yeah, there's, yeah. There's but that's, Nike, that's, Venus okay. De Milo, yeah. okay, okay, okay. I'm I'm showing my ignorance of art. Right, so, it's okay. <laughs> all right. So we're we're talking about art. So so tell us about you know this, this sounds like a a loaded question, but why does art matter? So like why why do you care so much about art education? Gosh, I just got a book by Neil Gaiman, and I am blanking on the name of the illustrator, which is terrible. But it is called Art Matters, and it's these essays that he wrote. Neil Gaiman wrote about it. For me, um, God, we would just fall into a complete dark age intellectually without art. And I think we kind of started seeing that a little while ago when art and music were cut from a lot of public schools. Mm. And like people had no, there's no outlet. Uh, people need a creative outlet and people need art, whether they realize it or not, like to just help them learn and grow how to think how to see and experience the world around them. Um, because nothing nothing is ever purely logical, I guess, unless you're working <laughs> directly with computers and AI. But even then, if a problem arises, you need to be able to think outside of a box and to think and look at it in a new way, in a creative way, and fix whatever problem is there. Yeah, I. other than it giving me a job and a sense of purpose. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, oh, those things. Those th those little trivial things. That, you know, at work play where we say life is too short for work to suck and we want everyone <laughs> to experience joy and purpose in, in their work. Yeah, like that's exactly. that's pretty much irrelevant. Yeah, yeah not here. <laughs> no, like, <laughs> oh gosh, it's, I mean, art art is a reflection of who we are, not just as a culture. I think that's that's looking at it in a very big picture scope. You know, you can tell how people lived by the things they designed, the things they created that are left behind. I cried when I saw my first petroglyphs because it was just mm. like, you know, tens of thousands of years ago, someone's hand was here. Like, how beautiful is that? Mm. But it's also a reflection of like ourselves as individuals. And it can be, it doesn't have to be a visual art. It can be music. It can be gardening. It can be cooking in like whatever way kind of adds a spice of life to you, adds like a little extra joy and purpose to your, your day and your daily activities. I think that is why art is so important. Love that. Love that. We definitely want joy and purpose. So yeah, sure. I referenced improv earlier as uh, a type of performance art. Uh, if you've listened, listened to the podcast before, you know that that was my improv or improv was my pandemic hobby. And so, <laughs> <I'm> so glad. <laughs> um, because I needed a, a creative outlet, as a lot of folks did. So I don't bake. Uh, so, so I was not, uh, I, I, and I can't draw or sculpt or do any of the more traditional ones, but I can lie. So, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, uh, create characters and make things there you up. Go. So. <laughs> Acting. Acting. So I'm not an actor, but I, I can make crap up. So... <laughs> Uh, I got to know Alexandra through the course of those our Tuesday night dojo conversations, and and Alexandra actually took over for Jim um, once those uh, he had to step away. But uh, tell us about improv. So for folks who aren't familiar or hear improv and, and immediately think like whose line is it any, anyway, kind of expand our horizon. So what what is this and and yeah. I'm blab. I'm blabbling. So, Mark blabbling. Will shut up. I'm blabbling. Yeah, it's You're not right. even a word. <laughs> it is now. Um, gosh, what is improv? What a wild and big question. <laughs> <laughs> 
for those of you who do only know it as Whose Line Is It Anyway, like that's fantastic because what a fun show. And that would be <laughs> in the industry known <laughs> as short form games. Improv is kind of interesting in terms of many things. One, it is something that we do in our lives every single day, oftentimes without realizing it. We're on a, a world stage in a sense. In the simplest terms, improv, whether it's long form, which is where you're doing like essentially a play uh, without a script. Um, it can be 15 minutes. It can be, you know, an hour and a half, whatever you want. Or a short form where it's like very structured, rule-based games. It is a way to play, which is, I think, really important. But it's it's kind of like a... a a self-exploration. Again, I'm kind of coming back to that self-exploration or like self-identification through art. It's becoming comfortable with your own mind, with your mm. own thoughts, and kind of letting go of that like connection of brain to mouth. Like, is what I'm about to say okay? Because unless you're going to say something absolutely horrendous and not cool at all, yes, Yes, and it is okay for you to, to think and speak in the way that you do. It's just one of the most free form ways of performing it, because nothing will ever be like it again. And I don't know if I've answered your question. <laughs> no. Hey, we'll build on that. So um, I love what you said so far. So you mentioned that yes, and as a one of that philosophical underpinnings of improv. Can you uh, explain what that means to folks that aren't familiar? Yeah, oh, of course. So also a, like a fun book to kind of see some of the rules of improv would be Bossy Pants by Tina Fey. But the yes and is it's a support structure because we know how it all feels when we come to someone with an idea and we're like really excited to share this idea. And we're like, what do you think? And they say, no, like immediately that shuts you down. And it it can hurt. It can hurt. And you just like, you can't move forward from that. The yes and in improv is a support from your scene partner or to your scene partner. And it's helping you guys build up what you're creating together. So the idea is, you know, everything is right. Um, everything that you are creating together is right. And it is as it should be. And that yes and is a supporting foundational block to continue to build. Yeah, because we know that uh, when we say yes, it, that's sometimes conditional. So if I say yes, but that really means no. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that but is so, <laughs> like, that but is such a, a no kind of word, even if we don't intend it to be. But yes, and is inclusive, and you can move forward with that entirely. Yes, but here's the reason why I'm not gonna actually do mm -hmm. the thing that you asked me. You know, yeah. <laughs> well, just say idea. no. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Just tell me no. Like, yeah. yeah, that's a great idea, but it's like, oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. and I don't this this. I don't want to be mean, but but I, yeah. Oh. <laughs> you're being mean. Yeah, exactly. So I think one of the I went to a uh, workshop. I think it was at the uh, the training magazine conference in Orlando a few years back, and Second City uh, had a workshop there for the different business cool. folks attending, and they talked about that whole yes and idea, and that was my first time experiencing that and just going, oh, this wow. makes it this makes a ton of sense, and I think one of my big aha moments was seeing just how much overlap there is between you know what's appropriate in a lot of the you know, in your day to day work context mm -hmm. and improv and what's and the overlap between improv activities and experiential learning activities. Yeah. So Jim would sometimes lead a game and I'll be like, I know that game. Yeah, that's, right. <laughs> that's not that's not an improv game. That's a ropes course game. Like, <laughs> oh, oh, did you do it on a ropes course? Well, no. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and it's like the same, you know, we're, we're doing, you know, zip zap or whatever, you know, I forget what. Zip, zap, zap. Yeah, that one. Yeah. You know, I was like, I, yeah, I learned, I learned that one. You know, we do that before we go on the climbing wall, you know? Yeah. So 
it's, I think it's just absolutely fascinating. And, you know, as I've had Jim as my professional coach, you know, it's, it's been really neat to learn from him. So thank you, Jim. Yeah, uh, love you. Thank appreciate you. You. you know, just seeing how much understanding things like, um, you know, self-awareness, self-awareness is huge. The ability to really listen without thinking about, you know, some, about what I'm going to say next. Like, no, I'm genuinely listening. And like, that's a hard skill and, and we need to practice it. Yeah. So, so improv I know has made me a better communicator. Uh, if you're listening to the podcast, like just hear what I sounded like before it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but it, you know, it's, it's helped me think it's helped me understand self-awareness. It's helped me interact with people better. It, you know, this idea of always being supportive and, and trying to make your scene partner look brilliant uh, is just like, what if we did that more often? Like, hey, today, my goal, my goal in this meeting is to make other people look good. Oh, my God. <laughs> uh, meetings would be so much better. Oh. <laughs> like, for certain. For, and yeah, like, I do want a quick shout out, like, to Jim Carwish, because yeah, I would not be essentially where I'm headed towards today without him as well. Like him and Oren Morris were two of the most influential people in my life. And it's all thanks to them. Well, uh, good. We just asked that question early. Who is someone who helped you or supported you in your career? Yeah. We've already answered it. Fantastic. There it is. It's those two, <laughs> those two guys. And there have been so many other amazing teachers, but those two definitely stick out as like the most influential, both in like improv art and life. They're amazing Love it. people. Love it. Um, but yeah, I, completely agree with everything you said about needing to listen more. So thank yes. you for that. Yes. <laughs> Nailed it. No. <laughs> All right. So let's thinking about, it's a disservice calling them hobbies, but uh, thinking about your artistic pursuits, how have those, you know, we're talking about this a little bit, how have your art and your sculpting and your painting and drawing and even improv influenced your teaching? I mean, improv, as we just talked about, it teaches you how to listen for certain, uh, you know, kids come up to me and I've, I've worked with kids and adults, you know, they'll come up and be completely frustrated with whatever they're working on. And so with improv, I'm able to really tune into them, really listen and let them know that they're being heard. Um, with like the visual arts, it's just learning patience because you have this image just burning in your head of what you want something mm. to look like. Um, and you want to get it out as quickly as possible, but the process, like the process between your brain and your hand is not a very fast <laughs> one. <laughs> um, so you learn kind of how to take a step back and it's something I'm still working on for certain. Cause I have like 30 projects in my head and I'm like, Oh my, I want to do all of them. And sometimes <laughs> it's so crippling that you don't start any of them, but it's learning that patience of just take your time. It'll get done. And also, you know, teaching people, what I really love, especially with clay, is you know if a student's really like stuck on something, and we're gonna get to do this this year because they're gonna learn like a little bit of carving before mm -hmm. they get into their stone carving. My friend Kyle, uh, Kyle taught me this, where you just take the block of clay that they're working with and then twist it, and now like it just kind of opens their minds to like this is a completely three D thing. Like I don't have to just look at it in one way. Now let me like look at it in different ways like just turn it or physically like twist it so there's so that there's like now this like <laughs> no one can see what we're doing with our hands but <laughs> yeah, exactly. we're we're making very wizard like hand motions uh... <laughs> i just realized yeah this is all audio um so you're essentially like taking the clay and molding it in a way where the clay itself starts to twist and turn so it's not a straight block anymore it's now this kind of organic looking shape almost like a like an hourglass maybe almost like an hourglass or hourglass not our grass, or like a twisted tree trunk. Okay. It would be kind of the, the visual texture. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just really fun seeing them be like, oh, wow, like you can do that. Or if they're working on a drawing and they stuck, you just turn the paper like 90 degrees. And it's one of those things where like you just have to shift your vision and shift your brain. And so... Doing these things has helped me be able to teach them because I have that life experience. I have that sense of like, wow, I'm really frustrated with this piece. What do I do? And I've had other people be like, here, just do this. 
or look mm-hmm. at it this way or you know what do you think of blah 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 you're like oh didn't think about that so with that also being said in how to critique and learning how to take critique mm. I think is one of the most important parts of teaching in general and teaching art specifically because it's it's with improv it's learning how to say yes i see where you're going with this idea and i'm wondering if i can push you in a different direction um, mm-hmm. like what do you think of that so it's it's a mixture of yes and and yes but because you're mm-hmm. not you don't want to say no but you do want to get people outside of their comfort zone in terms of looking at something or thinking about something um i'm i never thought i would say this but I miss having like official critiques because we Mm -hmm. had them a ton in university and you're like dreading it in the beginning. You're like, Oh God, everyone's going to tear this apart. But I miss it because it does push you to get better and better um, each time because it's different eyes and different brains looking at what you're creating. That's, that's fascinating. So I, I never uh, had considered kind of, how an artist may crave feedback, even though it's painful, or, you know, it can be tied to your, like, this came from the heart, this came from the soul, like, you're saying I have a terrible soul, (laughs) you know, (laughs) your soul sucks, you know, like, uh, but, but just how we all crave feedback and how that's important and helps us grow and and move forward. So certain, yeah, and it's, and you, you do kind of learn to take it in a sense like water off a duck's back because you realize like, you know, someone's going to approach your art and they'll be like, well, I don't like A, B and C. And A, B and C might have been really, really deep, meaningful brush strokes to you. And it's like, OK, well, I hear you, um, but I'm not going to change it. You know, it's it's just like I think any piece of art that makes you feel a any certain way whether you're like oh i freaking hate this or like (laughs) immediate confusion or just joy i think is just successful um because i that's how i feel about andy warhol i look at his art and i'm like oh i hate this but i'm like uh i give him that like respect of like well done sir (laughs) is is he is he the campbell soup he is the campbell soup guy yeah okay (laughs) yeah he's campbell soup yeah i'm like uh i i see what you're doing and i don't like it but i respect that You've made me feel a way about it. I wish you guys could see Alexandra right now, because as she described hating a piece of art, she had the biggest smile on her face. <laughs> <laughs> I hate this smile. Yeah. <laughs> Just standing at it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There are so many artists who, not so many, I won't say that, but there are very specific, very high name artists that I am awed at their work. It's amazing, but I'm still like, Oh, you son of a gun. I do not like you. Like, how dare you? <laughs> who, uh, just out of curiosity, who are some of your artistic uh, inspirations? So, like, who, who you're like, man, if, if you are not into art and want to really appreciate, and I know I'm using art in a very, very large, <laughs> broad, but yeah, who, who are some folks that you're just like, hey, this is worth checking out? Oh, man. So, Clive Barker actually was one of the very first. Um, artists that was really influential to me because I found his book The Aberat when I was in high school and it's his one of his very few like YA books and he did like 150 oil paintings for it Hmm. and it is and I'm sorry my people who are just the the audio you cannot see it but it's just very like oh wow it's really kind of abstracted it's very fantastical It's... it's very bright and colorful um, little little trippy. <laughs> yeah, kind of trippy, a little creepy, but that that goes without saying for Clive Barker um, and his his writing and his style. Yeah, I absolutely love it, and I fell in love with it when I was you know in oh, in high neat. school. Yeah, so he would be the first one that I would say would be incredibly influential. Then, like Lena Victor is a contemporary artist in London right now. And her portraits that I saw and her constellation work um, is just absolutely gorgeous. It's just very striking poses, very beautiful use of like color. She's awesome. Let me think. Cause there, it's like, I can, I can sometimes see the art, but I don't remember the artist's name. Mm. <laughs> so like, that's <laughs> really not great. I love Art Nouveau style. I think that kind of very like viney 
organic kind of style is very beautiful. Um, for history, I do enjoy like Toulouse Lautrec. Okay. Um, that very kind of like old old style like impressionistic is is just fun. There's too many in terms of the visual artists. When I think of art, you know, I think of the four Ninja Turtles. So. <laughs> <laughs> I really wish that those I, I would love to believe that like Michelangelo and like Leonardo da Vinci actually got together, put bandanas on and fought crime. Like that would be incredible. That I love that idea. <laughs> I mean, that all, like, <laughs> like could you write a book where the actual artists got together as opposed to ninja oh like, you, I, I think you're onto something. Oh dude. All right. <laughs> I'll put it in the, the <laughs> backlog of too many projects I had wanted to do. But yeah, oh my God. Because it was like, what was it? Raphael, Leonardo, Michelangelo, and... Donatello. Donatello, thank you. Yeah. I know my turtles. <laughs> <laughs> you know them better than I know my art history right now. Oh. Well, dating myself, it, it, I think that originally came out when I was about fifth grade and I used to draw little comic strips oh, of the Ninja awesome. Turtles like fighting and my drawing's terrible. But <laughs> but I, I, I enjoyed like the idea of creating stories for the turtles. Yes. So. I'm here for that. <laughs> that was that was me in Power Rangers for yeah. certain. And I also made little side scroll video games. So like I'd make my own levels of Super Mario Brothers. No way, it, that's so yeah. cool. Um you know, like it was just like I, I, yeah, I think I'm creative, but it just took me a while to find my medium. Yeah. Uh, and uh, improv was awesome when I just, dis- uh, not I discovered improv. When, <laughs> when improv discovered me, no, that's that's wrong too. Uh, <laughs> when you when, fell into improv's lap? Uh, yeah, how yes. Did, yeah. yeah. <laughs> When me, when me and improv swiped left or yeah, right or, or whichever, I, I don't, I don't, I don't know which way you swipe. I, I, uh, I've only used it uh, Tinder once, and it was for about thirty minutes, and I was done. <laughs> okay. Anyway, um, when <laughs> during that time in which I performed improv, I, I realized, man, I've been making up crap my entire life, <laughs> and per, and just, just, just because I think it's fun and. Also, like creating activities, like nobody says I'm an artist. I make, you know, experiential games uh, yeah. as as my artistic expression. But that's yeah. that's one of the things I love doing. We have been chatting with Alexandra Goodrich, teacher, artist, improv performer, and part time linguist. <laughs> <laughs> Stay tuned for part two. If you enjoy this podcast, please leave a review, tell a friend, give us a gold star. Or call my grandma. And if you want unforgettable events and training that's fun, like for real fun, get started today at WorkplaySolutions.com. I know I want that. <laughs> boo, boo, boo. Oh, crap. I forgot what I was, where I was going with <laughs> that. okay. Uh, we've de- definitely this has been a whole morning of like going off on tangents.